So I'd now like to uh, sort of more formally introduce our speaker. Um, Father John Baer is uh, Dean of St. Vladimir's Orthodox uh, Theological Seminary in Crestwood, New York. He has been Dean now for five years, uh, but has spent uh, 15 years now, is that correct, at, at St. Vladimir's. And he's getting to that point in many academics' careers where he finds that he now has colleagues whom he previously taught, uh, which is, I think, probably a great credit to, uh, to many things, not, not the least of which is uh, Father John's uh, eminent uh, teaching and scholastic abilities. Uh, he is Professor of Patristics at St. Vladimir's Orthodox Seminary, a noted author, uh, particularly of his works uh, The Way to Nicaea and the Companion Text, The Nicene Faith. He is also the author of the recent, relatively recent publication, A Mystery of Christ, Life and Death. Um, also recently appeared in a very good video on uh, the Nicene Creed that was put out by First Things. If you haven't seen the video, I would highly recommend it to you. He has also been a visiting lecturer in patristics at Fordham University and has also lectured at Harvard Divinity School. Uh, Father uh, John holds an undergraduate degree from uh, that great august institution, Thames Polytechnic, in uh, London in the UK, which was, as he explains it, the only uh, place in the UK where you could take, um, sort of uh, do work on Emmanuel Levinas. And so Father's uh, first uh, love is uh, a study of Levinas. He then moved on to uh, the University of Oxford, where he did his MPhil and his DPhil in the Patristic Studies with um, Metropolitan Callistos of the Euclea. Um, Father John um, comes from an um, Orthodox family. His father is also a priest. Uh, his grandfather, Father John tells me, um, was the first Russian Orthodox priest to come to the UK after the revolution, um, arriving there in 1926. On his mother's side, he is a Swiss-German background, and I believe you mentioned, Father, that uh, your grandparents met at a Karl Barth seminar in, uh, at Basel. So uh, lots of interesting um, academic roots and, and uh, religious roots in the life of the church there. Um, Father John, um, as I said, is, is no stranger to many of us who uh, work in the area of Eastern Christian studies. Um, as uh, one other august uh, professor uh, of Eastern Christian Studies who will uh, go nameless, although he has just taken a seat in the front row, um, <laughs> has, has described uh, Father John Baer as probably the leading uh, Orthodox theologian now in North America. So without further ado, uh, Father John, we invite you to address us. Thank you very much, everybody, for being here this evening. Um, I know it's hot. It's late in the evening, or be beginning to be late in the evening. I hope... Um, the atmosphere won't get too heavy and too head heady. And thank you very much for your kind words of introduction, Andrew. It's really been my pleasure to be with you at Augustine College this day, to get to meet all your students and see the work that you do. It's really very, very impressive. Thank you for that. And thank you for not mentioning the cheese. <laughs> Don't ask. <laughs> In a recent um, book by Professor Andreas Kostenberger and Michael Kruger, they gave it a title, and the title really speaks volumes about our present climate. The title of the book, published in 2010, is The Heresy of Orthodoxy. Subtitle, How Contemporary Culture's Fascination with Diversity Has Reshaped Our Understanding of Early Christianity. The Heresy of Orthodoxy. The title plays upon by reversing the kind of headlines that we've become all too accustomed to hear today. Headlines such as the real truth about the historical Jesus. I can be sure that as we come to Easter, Pascha, we're going to get another magazine with another such title. Was the tomb really empty? Wasn't it really empty? Other titles that we hear constantly today would be things such as new documents discovered that shed light upon the real Jesus. Or, in the kind of field I work in, it would be why the so-called heretics were really right. The rise of the bishops and their patriarchal power. Or, another one I saw, the intolerance of orthodoxy and the marginalization of the so-called heretics. And then, any number of variations upon that theme. 
Okay, that's uh, what they're playing upon when they call their book the, the Heresy of Orthodoxy. Now, behind all such headlines, there is a common thrust. And that would be that the newly discovered texts, such as the so-called Gnostic material found at Nag Hammadi in the middle of the last century, or just a few years ago now, the recently discovered Gospel of Judas, that these newly discovered texts, or perhaps new insights gained through new critical analyses of familiar material, such as the dissection of the familiar canonical New Testament material by the Jesus Seminar to ascertain what Jesus really said and did. There's a common first, so either by this rediscovery of new material or by insights gained through new critical methods, we can get a basis which cuts through the biased interpretation or misrepresentation of those apostolic texts favored by an increasingly authoritative patriarchal episcopacy. And by cutting through that history, we can arrive at the original, the pure truth about Jesus, who he really was, what really happened. Was he really a Jewish rabbi with a particularly liberal or a particularly apocalyptic message? Perhaps the tomb wasn't really empty. Perhaps it was simply misidentified. We can get to the real history of what happened in all of this. And then by doing so, the underlying presupposition is by doing this, we can then correct Catholic or Orthodox Christianity. Where this Catholic or Orthodox Christianity is understood as an institutionalized, monolithic, uniform, uniformity intolerant of any diversity. Okay? That's the heresy of orthodoxy today. Now, there are two particular presuppositions behind much of this work. And in fact, they stand somewhat uneasily together, but never mind. The first is a certain historicism, which presumes that to get to the real Jesus, the real historical Jesus, we have to go behind, as it were, behind the passion. We have to get to the time before the cross, to the real life, the real actions, the real teachings of Jesus himself rather than the interpretations of him provided after the Passion. So there's a kind of historicism evident at work in that. I'm going to come back to that. The second presupposition is that orthodoxy or Catholicism, and I'm just using those terms interchangeably for the first millennium, orthodoxy or Catholicism claims a strict uniformity and is intolerant of diversity. Diversity, after all, would be seen as being a threat to patriarchal power or whatever else it might be. Whereas it's presumed, it's claimed, especially following Walter Bauer in the 20th century, that there was diversity from the very beginning. After all, the earliest Christian texts that we've got, the letters of Paul, already express disagreements about what Christianity is all about. They're written to correct errors. So, therefore, it's argued, any claims to an original apostolic deposit which has been kept in its purity by the Catholic or the Orthodox Church and from which heretics have departed is claimed as simply false. There has been diversity from the beginning and this gospel of diversity, as Kostenberg and Kruger put it, is so familiar to us today because it's so reassuringly modern or postmodern. Okay, so that's our contemporary situation. But really, things are not that simple. It's a fact that our only access to Christ is through interpretation. We don't have any uninterpreted, raw, historical data about anything. Everything is already interpreted and subject to further interpretation. So the question is always one of interpretation. What grounds it? What legitimates it? How are you doing it? And so from the beginning, Christianity has been a community of interpretations. 
Moreover, when we look at someone like St. Irenaeus of Lyon in the late second century, and he really is the first writer to give a coherent and comprehensive account of orthodoxy. And so he, more than anybody else, has become the bogeyman of those who have proclaimed the gospel of diversity. Charles Hill, in a recent book called Who Chose the Gospels, which does the same kind of thing as Kostenberger does, has got two chapters, one on the ugly Irenaeus and one on the lonely Irenaeus. The ugly Irenaeus because, for much modern scholarship, Irenaeus is an ugly figure depicting this patriarchal power, this authoritative stamp of orthodoxy, and it's something they simply don't like. And for others, it's the lonely Irenaeus because within this gospel of diversity, surely he must just have been one voice and therefore a lonely figure rather than representing a broad swathe of the church. So they really don't like Irenaeus. He's a person I did my early work on, and I still read every year and still find ever more in him. Okay. When we turn to someone like Irenaeus, and again, he is the first person, really, to give a very clear, coherent account of orthodoxy, of Catholicism, of tradition, of canon, of scripture, of how it all fits together. The first person to write a work called Against the Heresies, there's some early writings that are now lost, but he's the first one we've got extent. When we look at his works, we will find actually that those whom he describes as heretics are precisely those who left the church of their own accord rather than through episcopal condemnation. They left the church of their own, of their own accord, left the great church of their own accord the great church being the expression of Galen in the middle of the second century for the broad range of the common church that he could see. The heretics left the church of, their, of the great church to found their own churches, someone like Marsham, or who gradually drifted away from Orthodox Catholic Christianity as the, did the Gnostic disciples of Valentinus. They denigrated as merely psychic those who, unlike themselves, were not truly spiritual. So actually, if anything, it was the heretics who were intolerant. And the Catholic Church, which preached toleration and was open to diversity. The great church was Catholic, not because it was a universal monolithic institution, but it was Catholic, actually, because it embraced diversity. Now, that really is an unorthodox claim to make in today's scholarly community uh, climate. But let me be really absolutely clear. I don't mean to suggest that Christian leaders such as Irenaeus accepted any and every teaching claiming to be Christian. Clearly not. Nor do I mean to imply that during the course of the second century, the great church already had a fixed and clear understanding of its faith and parameters. Also not. But when Martian went before the presbyters of the church in Rome in the mid-150s and tried to persuade them of his particular theology, that the God of the Old Testament is a different God from the God of the New Testament, he was not well received. And so this became an occasion to become clearer about the faith that was shared between the different representatives of the great church. And Martian would have none of it. He separated from the great church with its diversity. He was the one who separated from that diversity to establish a church which agreed with himself. It's really striking. So the actual picture is the other way around than it's depicted. Yeah? The heretics are the intolerant ones, not able to cope with other people, having different voices in a conversation together. And when they encounter that, and they realize that other people may not share their opinion, they go and separate themselves to form a church by themselves with people who happen to agree with them. And they go and do their own thing. Likewise, a few decades later, 180, 190, that kind of time, when Irenaeus did intervene in the life of the church in Rome, the Christian community in Rome, it was not, as Elaine Pagel suggested, that he demanded that heretical books be burnt or false teachers be excommunicated, but he urged them to make clear who had separated already. 
be clear about those who have separated and um, mark the boundary with that. They have separated. And while recognizing their separation, he urged tolerance and acceptance of diversity among those who remain together. For instance, in his letter to Pope Victor regarding a celebration of the Pascha, he writes that our diversity in practice confirms our unity in faith. Okay? Open to diversity within certain parameters, but a diversity which expresses a commonality of faith. So it was this great church that was precisely the place in which diversity was recognized as being an integral element of its Catholicity. Catholic because universal, because embracing all. Some, such as Martian, were not able to um, endure that, and they departed from that broad body. They were not cast out. The church at that point had no organ for excommunication. He departed from that broad body after his attempts at reformation were not received. Others gradually drifted away, such as Valentinus, considering themselves possessors of higher knowledge. So splits happened in the early church, and people went off and founded their own sects and heresies and so on. Um, but they did so in order to keep with what they think rather than taking part in a broader conversation. These splits and these tensions helped the great church clarify and identify itself and its shared basis. Its shared basis as a community of interpretation, a community of ecclesial practice, a community with this conversation. So rather than thinking of this community of conversation, this community of interpretation, in terms of a static apostolic deposit, which is given down to the first bishop by the apostles and then simply preserved intact in the, over generations in the way that it's often depicted. It's better actually to think in terms adopted from Irenaeus, in terms of a symphony. It's a symphony. It's a conversation. It's a melody. It's a symphony comprised of different voices throughout, each, throughout time, each lending themselves to the melody being played with different timbres, different tonalities, different inflections and different themes. And each voice in turn being shaped into that melody. And that image of a melody is actually a really attractive one because it also means that the symphony is not constructed by any individual voice, as Martian's single note might be. Okay? The, the symphony is not constructed by any individual voice, but is governed by its own rhythms and its rules as everyone learns how to take part in it. So that, one can say, as, as Irenaeus says, it's God who has harmonized us to the symphony of salvation. So, the question of orthodoxy and diversity in early Christianity is not what it's depicted in much of the modern literature. In fact, it's the other way around. The church understood itself as being a community of interpretation from the beginning. Okay. And we've got no way of avoiding this question of interpretation. And we can see that very clearly, very dramatically, when we turn to the canonical Gospels. Okay, think about the canonical Gospels, especially the synoptics. I'll come back to John in a minute. But the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Now, really, the most striking thing about these Gospels, about their description of Christ, of his life, of his work, of his deeds, and so on, is that although all the disciples, the disciples accompanied him for this period of time, three years traditionally, three years of time, they saw him doing all of these things. They saw him working miracles. They heard his teaching. They heard whatever his mother had to say. They saw him transfigured on the mountain. They heard all of this, yet they go and abandon him at the time of the crucifixion. They don't get it. There's only one time in the Synoptic Gospels before the Passion when one of the disciples recognizes who he is, and that's Peter on the road to Caesarea Philippi. Matthew 16, Christ asks, who do you say I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Christ says, you did not know this by flesh and blood, by, by seeing me, by holding my hand, whatever it might be, but by revelation of the Father. You are Peter on this rock, I'll build my church. By the way, I have to go to Jerusalem to suffer. At which point Peter says, no way, that's never going to happen to you. And immediately Christ says, get behind me, Satan. So the one time when one of the disciples recognizes and states who Christ is, two or three verses later he gets called Satan. Which, you know, coming from the Son of God himself, it's really strong language. (laughs) It, it, It would have me quaking in my boots. Especially having just been the only disciple to have made the right confession. Yeah? So really a point's being made that the only time before the Passion when one of the disciples recognizes who he is, he doesn't get it because he tries to stop Christ going to Jerusalem to suffer. Yeah? Satan is the one who gets between Christ and the cross. Okay? So they come to the crucifixion. They all run away in fear and trembling. Peter denies him. They don't get it when they see the empty tomb. Yeah? The women turn up at the empty tomb and their first reaction is, what's happened? Has somebody stolen the body? They don't get it. You know, an empty tomb is ambiguous after all. It doesn't mean anything. The question is, well, what is the significance of this? It takes an angel to explain to them, saying, don't you remember what he said? He said, we'd rise, now go and meet him in Galilee. The women go back and tell the disciples. And what do the disciples say? You've got up too early this morning. You're crazy. Okay. Think about it. They did not understand before the time of the cross. They didn't understand when they see him on the cross. And they didn't understand when they see the empty tomb. That's really striking. If there's an article in Time magazine in a few weeks' time saying, was the tomb really empty? Well, you could really reply by saying, what what difference does it make? Because those who were there and saw it, they didn't get it from seeing the empty tomb. Yeah? They saw the empty tomb... It meant nothing to them. So what do we think we would establish by getting into an argument about whether it was really empty or not? It meant nothing to them in that way. Okay? And then let's go one step further. Um, they're on the road to Emmaus after all of this. Christ turns up. Okay? He's been dead, what, for three days? And they don't recognize him. And not only do they not recognize him, they say, what, are you a stranger here? Haven't you heard what's been happening? Haven't you heard about this Jesus who we thought was going to save us, but he went and got himself killed? And then he was buried, and now we went to the tomb, and they find the tomb is empty, and we can't figure out what is going on. Yeah? When you read through it like that, it's actually really quite humorous. (laughs) They are really slow. No wonder he has to abrade them all the time. Oh, foolish men and slow of heart to believe. Okay? But the important point, the really important point, is that they did not understand him by seeing him in the flesh and blood, by seeing him on the cross, by seeing the empty tomb, even by seeing the risen Christ. They did not get it. What happens then, of course, is that he opens the books, the hearts start to burn within them, he reproves them, a foolish man, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. He opens the book and shows how he had to suffer. The books meaning the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. Moses and all the prophets. Their hearts start to burn. They persuade him to stay the night. He breaks bread. Their eyes are finally opened in the breaking of the bread. And as soon as they recognize him, he disappears. Okay? So we're always left waiting for him. We're always left in expectation of him. We're always left looking for his coming. And the only two means by which we've got to encounter him is the opening of the scriptures and the breaking of the bread. Being there 2,000 years ago didn't help the disciples. Okay? And it wouldn't have helped us either had we been there. Okay. This opening of scripture and the breaking of the bread then, that is how they come to know who it is they're talking about really important, because it now places us immediately within the context of interpretation. Yeah, it's not just a matter of having been there with him, hearing what he said, hearing what his mother might have said, whatever else it might be. From the beginning, we are placed in the question of interpretation. And now it's interpretation through the scriptures. He opens the scriptures to show how it spoke about himself. That's how we know him. Okay? Interestingly, this opening of the scripture and the breaking of the bread are two fundamental things for the Apostle Paul. 
in Corinthians 15. There are only two places where the apostle uses a particular formula, which is, I delivered to you what I received. Okay? It's, a, it's a technical formula of handing on. And that word, I deliver, uh, in Greek it's paredoke, which is a verbal form of the noun tradition. So I traditioned to you. I handed on to you. I'm, I'm laying down for you what I've received. He uses that formula only twice. First in Corinthians 15, I delivered to you as of first importance what I received, that Christ, decide, Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture. He was buried and was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scripture. Okay? In accordance with the Scripture. So important, it's mentioned twice within one sentence. Okay? And then the second place is in 1 Corinthians 11. I received from the Lord himself what I delivered to you, perevoke it means, that the Lord Jesus, in the night in which he was betrayed, took bread, gave thanks, broke it, said, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. So two same things. Opening of the scriptures for the crucifixion and resurrection and the breaking of the bread, do this in remembrance of me. And those are the two things which he said, I traditioned to you. That's the basis of what tradition is all about. So, tradition established right at the very heart of that delivery. That, that delivery. And that delivery is already in an exegetical mode in relationship to the scriptures. The law, the Psalms, the prophets. Opening the scriptures to understand Christ. Okay? The scriptures are not Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. When Paul says Christ died in accordance with the scripture, he means the law, the Psalms, and the prophets. You get exactly the same point when you consider the example of Paul himself. Think about Paul, Saul, before he became Paul. Saul was trained to a very, very high level in reading the scripture. By Rabbi Gamaliel, he knew the, 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 the rabbinic methods of executing the scripture. Okay. But he did not think of these scriptures as speaking of Christ until after he encountered Christ. Right? When, he first, when we first come across Paul, he is persecuting the church. He's saying things such as, I was blameless with respect to the law. I did not need this. I'm persecuting the church because they've got it wrong. Okay? He then encounters Christ on the road to Damascus, and then his reading changes. Really a fundamental point. So his reading changes. He will describe it in terms of the veil that's over the text has been lifted, 2 Corinthians 4. What has changed is not the text itself. He's reading the same text as he ever had done. What's changed is his starting point. And I'm going to come back to this question of starting point um, repeatedly in a few minutes. Interestingly, with what we've seen on the road to Emmaus and Paul with um, the different ways in which he's reading scripture before his encounter with Christ and after, it exemplifies four points that James Kugel makes with regard to what scripture is in antiquity. Okay, there are four characteristics of any text to counter scripture in antiquity. First of all, it has to be cryptic. It sounds completely contradictory to what we normally think. You know, a text is there, we might have to use a dictionary, figure it out, but we can get the meaning of it. No, the point is, a text is cryptic. Think about the road to Emmaus. Christ opens the books. Well, it's not as if they hadn't been physically opened before, but they hadn't been explained. The disciples had been reading the words on the page. Paul had been reading the words on the page since his early years, but he hadn't understood what they're talking about. So it's cryptic. The second point is that it's uniform. Okay? Christ opens the books, and lo and behold, they all speak about him, the one who opened the books. Okay? Moses and all the prophets have been talking about how the Christ had to suffer to enter into his glory. That's the subject throughout. The books are open. It all speaks about him. He's the word of God. The third point is that they are contemporary. It's not about things in the past as we are so accustomed to reading scripture, what really happened? Did 
Israel really leave um, Egypt in time of an exodus? When was it? How did it really happen? As if it's a historical account. The point is it's cryptic, it's open, it speaks about the one who opens it, and therefore it's all contemporary. These things are not written about the past, but for us upon whom the end of the world has come. And the fourth point would be that they're inspired. Okay? And that act of inspiration cannot be separated from the opening of the scriptures and the reading of the scriptures. We tend to think of inspiration as being something that happened in the mind of Isaiah or Ezekiel way, 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 way back when. Um, and our only question would be, did he know what he was talking about? Was he writing down under divine inspiration? Whatever else it might be. But the point would be that nobody really knew what Isaiah was talking about until the books were opened. Yeah? Nobody was expecting a crucified Messiah born from a virgin. Okay? So it's only after the passion of books are open we can see what Isaiah is talking about, which means you can't separate the inspiration of Isaiah from the opening of the book of Isaiah and from the inspired reading of Isaiah. It all works through one, one act of inspiration. Okay? Now, this understanding of Christ the crucified and risen one, proclaimed according to the scriptures, is what we have in the canonical New Testament. The earliest gospel, Gospel of Mark, starts off, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, as it says in Isaiah. Yeah. Matthew and Luke, all the way through, this is done that this might be fulfilled, all the way through. In the gospel of John, most emphatically, when Christ says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me, because he wrote of me. Okay? So they're all centered upon the crucified and risen Christ, and they're all told using the language of Scripture. And there's also a movement in the canonical Gospels, the movement from the synoptics, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, to the Gospel of John. The Gospel of John really begins where the other Gospels conclude, as strange as it might seem. The other Gospels conclude that the disciples are ignorant all the way through, and the very end, the, gospel, the, the books are opened, and they finally understand who he is. But that's how the Gospel of John begins. After the prologue in the Gospel of John, the Baptist cries out when he sees Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God. You're already taken straight into that identification at the very beginning in, in the first chapter. Behold the Lamb of God. And then Philip goes and tells Nathaniel, a couple of verses later, we have found the one of whom Moses in the law and the prophets wrote. So if you, you're given that at the very beginning of the Gospel of John, not at the end as in the others. The Gospel of John continues with that left off. Then Christ tells Philip and Nathaniel, you think that's great, you're going to see better things than those. Okay. So the Gospel of John why John's called a theologian, presents us with the same work of Christ, but now told from a divine perspective. No longer merely recounts the history of Christ, but it sees that work within a framework of Scripture and tells it that way from the beginning. Now, in contrast, it is exactly that engagement with Scripture in the light of the kerygma, in the light of the proclamation of the crucified and risen one, that is completely absent from works such as the Gospel of Thomas or the Valentinian Gospel of Truth. The Gospel of Thomas is a bunch of sayings attributed to Jesus, some of which parallel the sayings in Matthew and Luke and others which seem to be a bit more Gnostic. We don't really know where they came from. But there is no passion in the Gospel of Thomas, and there's no engagement with Scripture. If I really want to be provocative, I'd say something like, the Gospel of Thomas may well preserve the most authentic historical information we have, but my point would be, who knows and who cares? Yeah. Who knows because... When we lay claim to something being authentically historical, what are we in fact doing? What do we mean when we say that something is really historically true and other things are not? Yeah. It's actually a really subjective interpretation on the basis of whatever evidence happens to have come down to us, which is always partial. 
So who knows? You know, we can argue about, about that forever, which is why there's a new real historical Jesus on the bookstores of Barnes & Noble every year. <laughs> and who cares? Because that attempt at reconstructing is not understanding Christ in the light of the Passion through the Scriptures. And as we saw, that is the only way the disciples come to know who he is. You know? So it's doing something very, very different. So it's this interpretive engagement with the Scripture in our contemplation of Christ. This provides the best framework for understanding the appeal made to canon, tradition, creed in the early church, succession, all the different elements which go together to make up orthodoxy or the heresy of orthodoxy or the only choice of orthodoxy, really. And the person who does this is Irenaeus. Irenaeus does it more than anybody else, the first person to do it. He begins to explain this in his book Against the Heresies, and he does so by using a very vivid and immediately understandable image. He suggests that his opponents use Scripture in the way that those people who take a mosaic of a king and rearrange the stones to produce an image of a dog or a fox. So Scripture is like a mosaic of the king. It speaks of Christ. But his opponents have taken the pieces, rearranged them, and from an image of the king, they've ended up with a, with a picture of, a, of the fox or a dog. And then they claim that this is the true and original image. He argues that they do this because they've worked from a different hypothesis, not the one proclaimed by the apostles, taught by the Lord, and preached by the apostles, proclaimed by the prophets, taught by the Lord, proclaimed, uh, preached by the apostles. Rather, they started from a different hypothesis, a different presupposition, a different starting point. And on the basis of this different starting point, they've rearranged the order of the scriptures, the verses, the connection between the different words and images. They've disjointed, he says, they've disjointed the members of the truth and attempted to give their own hypothesis a plausibility by using the scriptural language. He gives an example of people who take verses from Homer Take a verse from Homer here, 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 rearrange all these verses, and you could tell a completely different story. Yeah? The trouble is that one who knows Homer would be able to rearrange those passages in their proper order. Okay? So also he suggests that those who have received the canon of truth through baptism can rearrange the scriptural passages in their proper order to depict the image of the king. Now, the language he uses in all of this is really fascinating because it's got a long philosophical and literary background. He uses the term hypothesis. Okay, for us, it means you know, conjecture, supposition. But it's much more subtle than that in antiquity. In a literary context, the word hypothesis would mean the plot or the outline of a drama or an epic. It's what the poet would posit as the outline for his subsequent creative work. I'm going to write a poem about Oedipus. Well, I've got the plot, now I'm going to fill in the flesh by giving dialogues and whatever else it might be. Okay? So the, the, the plot, the hypothesis, is not derived from reasoning, but it's presupposed. It provides the structure, the skeleton, upon which the poet can give flesh. So according to Irenaeus, the Valentinians have used the words and phrases from Scripture, but put it to their own hypothesis. They've created their own fabrication, their own plasma. Okay. Now, in the other arts and sciences, it is likewise the hypothesis as that which is posited, the presupposition which facilitates both action and inquiry, and ultimately knowledge itself. Aristotle, in his Metaphysics, says simply that hypothesis are the starting point or the first principle of demonstration. For instance, he would give an example. 
the goal of help is a hypothesis for the doctor. The doctor doesn't deliberate whether he's going to pursue help or not. It's a given. And then he works on that hypothesis to um, deliberate how to attain it. Mathematicians, likewise, he suggests, hypothesize certain axioms and then proceed from those axioms with their demonstrations. These hypotheses are tentative if you come to a conclusion which is manifestly false or if the goal is completely unattainable, you have to revise your hypothesis. So again, according to Irenaeus, the heretics, the Valentinian Gnostics, have based their exegesis upon their own hypothesis rather than that foretold by the prophets, taught by Christ, and traditioned by the apostles. Okay. They, do, they start on their own hypothesis, their own starting point. Now, interestingly, at least since the time of Plato, the goal of philosophy has always been to try and discover the ultimate first principle, the non-hypothetical first principle. But even here, Aristotle concedes, it's impossible to ask for a demonstration of your first principle. Now think about that for a moment. That's exactly the point that Irenaeus is going to pick up on. It's impossible to ask for a demonstration, a proof of your first principle. If it's your first principle, the hypothesis which you are positing as the ground for your rational thought. Well, if you could prove it, it'd have to be by reference to something else. And that then becomes your hypothesis, your first principle. So you either are led into an infinite regress in which you've got no starting point, or ultimately you have to accept that your starting point depends upon faith. There is no way of, other way of doing it. So the search for the first principle of demonstration ends up, Clement of Alexandria points out, ends up with indemonstrable faith. If you could prove it, it has to be by reference to something else, and that then becomes your first principle. To give an example... In Christian theology, we do not say that Christ is true. Because if you could say that he's true, it would be by reference to something else by which you are judging him. Yeah? And so that actually would then be your God. Yeah? No, you don't say Christ is true. You say he is the truth. Very important difference. Okay? So the... Um, Hellenistic philosophers, they all knew that your first principle cannot be proved. Whatever area of knowledge you are talking about, it cannot be proved, but it depends upon faith. Unless you accept a starting point, you've got no ground for working out anything else. Okay? And this starting point also works as a canon. Now, when we use the word canon, we tend to think of the list of the books of Scripture. Well, the word canon was not used that way until 1768, I think it was. In antiquity, the word canon simply means a straight line. Okay? It, it, it's a guide, it's a rule by which you determine whether something is straight. Aristotle says, by that which is straight, we discern both the straight and the crooked. For the canon is a test of both. But the crooked test neither itself nor the straight. Only if you've got a line which is straight can you determine another straight line or a crooked line. So, you need a canon. Without a canon, without a criterion, knowledge is not possible. All inquiry will be led into endless regression. You will never know when you've, when you've hit the mark. So your first principle acts as a canon and so every account of philosophy from the Hellenistic period, um, 1st century BC to 2nd, 3rd century AD, starts off by giving an account of the criterion, of the canon, by which it will then work. Unlike the Gnostics who are mythologizing something new every day. Now the important point here is put well by Eric Osborne, who said, the rule, the canon, did not limit reason to make room for faith, 
but used faith to make room for reason. Without a credible first principle, reason was lost in an infinite regress. A really important point would be upheld by any Hellenistic philosopher, going back to Aristotle, yet it's the opposite of what we tend to think today. We tend to think that the rule of truth, the rule which you believe, the creed, marks out a space where reason doesn't have to work. Yeah? Because it's faith and you can't prove it, you can't talk about it, and you know, what do you really do with it anyway? Yeah? No, the point is actually the other way around. Unless you've got a canon, a criterion, which is acting as your starting point, your first principle, your hypothesis, you can't think. You know, unless you've got a line to determine whether something is straight or not, you're never going to be able to determine whether something is straight or not. Yeah? And as a hypothesis, as a first principle, you can't prove it, whatever field of knowledge it might be. You have to accept it on faith. Okay? So that's what Irenaeus, in his articulation of orthodox theology, is talking about when he appeals to a canon of truth. It's not to assert a hierarchical, patriarchal power against any free-thinking Gnostic. It's to make thought possible. Okay? When he is talking about tradition, it's not just simply that which we lay claim to and the Gnostics are claiming some other kind of tradition. It's specifically the tradition of understanding Christ according to the scriptures as goes back to Paul himself. I delivered to you what I received. Christ died in accordance with Scripture. Okay. So the, that, that's the fabric of orthodoxy. And what it does is to enable this understanding of the church as a community of interpretation, a conversation of interpretation, with different voices in it which are able to hear one another and blend together in one symphony rather than just being a disjarring single note like Martian who didn't want anybody else to be heard apart from himself and so founded a, a church of people who thought like himself. Okay. okay. There's one other area I want to talk about, <coughs> if you're with me so far. It's quite a take questions, but it's also 25 past 8, and then when I start talking, I tend not to stop. <laughs> okay. The second point of importance I want to talk about is that it's the crucified and risen Christ who is therefore the subject okay, the, or, or the, the, the subject of our reflection. It's not what happened before the cross. Those who were with him before the cross didn't get anything from that. They went and abandoned him, you know, whatever they heard. They understood it differently after the cross when the scriptures were open and so on. Okay? It's a crucified and risen Christ that is uh, the subject in all of this. Now, as the early, earliest Christians searched the scriptures to understand how God was at work in this Christ, one of the most important texts they came across, of course, was Isaiah 53, the hymn of the suffering servant. By, appealing, by going back to Isaiah 53, they could see that Christ was not simply put to death, but voluntarily went to his death. And by voluntarily going to his death, trampled down death by death, which we'll be seeing in a few weeks' time. Now, this is perhaps the hardest thing for us to hear altogether. That's why I have to sing it so often. Okay? And that's why we never listen to it. Okay, because what it means is that Christ shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being. And when you actually think through that, that is stunning. It's not that he dies because he's human, but because he's God, he's able to get himself out of the grave, as we often think. That would be a really bad Christology. That would be worth, worse than Nestorius. And more to the point, it wouldn't help anybody else. Okay. It would help him. He'd be able to get out, but nobody else would have to be benefited by that. Okay. Rather, it's by voluntarily going to his death as one over whom death has got no claim, for there was no sin in him. By voluntarily going to his death, he shows himself to be stronger than death. 
such that it cannot hold him. He shows us what it is to be God in the way that he dies as a human being. Now, for us, death is that which expresses all the weakness, all the frailty, all the, ultimately, absurdity of our existence. We've come into existence through no choice on our own part. As Kirillov says in The Possessed, Dostoevsky, nobody asked me if I wanted to be born. Yeah, there's no choice in my existence. No freedom in my existence. It's a given. And I'm thrown into an existence in which whatever I do, I will die. Again, with no choice. Okay? It's really absurd on one level. It expresses all the weakness, the futility, the impotence of whatever we think we can make of ourselves. But, moreover, in this way, death is the only thing which is common to all human beings from the beginning of the world onwards. And so it is here and nowhere else that Christ shows us how to live divinely, to be gods, to live divinely in the phase of St. Maximus by using death, by turning death inside out. So that rather than being the end, death, in fact, becomes the beginning, the beginning of life and freedom, resulting from a free decision that we make to no longer live according to this world, to die to myself, to die to Adam, to die to sins, to die to passion, to be baptized into the death of Christ, and so now begin to live for God, for my neighbor, living the life of sacrificial love that Christ has shown to be the life and the being of God himself. Okay? How else could we have had a part in the life and the being of God himself than by God showing what it is to be, Christ showing what it is to be God by dying as a human being? Really striking. So in this way, reading the whole of the scripture in the light of Christ, the crucified and risen one, and as speaking of him, this Christ is, as the apostle says, the image of the invisible God, in whom the fullness of divinity dwelt bodily, in Colossians. Think about that. The image of the invisible God. That means that we can't look elsewhere to see God, apart from in this crucified one. Paul says, I know nothing but Christ and him crucified. We can't look elsewhere. Okay? That's kind of coextensive with the idea of Christ opening a scripture and it all speaking about him. There's no part which is speaking about someone else. Okay? It's the image of the invisible God. We can't look elsewhere. The fullness of divinity has dwelt in him bodily. That means there is no surplus of divinity existing somewhere else to be attained through some other means. He is the definition of what God is. He's the logos of God. We say it all the time. We never think about it. You know? We tend to take the term logos meaning word or simply you know, a nice name for him. No, it's got meaning. Okay. Now, this is really hard to hear, that this is the definition of what God is. It, it shatters all our humanly constructed images of gods that we like to call upon to come and help us in, in the different ways that we do that. Yeah? It really shatters all of that. Okay? It's really hard to hear, and so it's not surprising that this is what all the great councils of the early centuries worked so hard to affirm. In Nicaea and Constantinople, the affirmation that Christ is the Son of God, and that's this Christ, is the Son of God, consubstantial with the Father. He is what it is to be God. He's not simply a man who lived in a godly way, or he's not simply the way that God chose to express himself back in the first century, as if he could choose to express himself somewhat differently today. 
but rather he's consubstantial with God. He's what it is to be God. The one proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with the scripture is what it is to be God, yet other than the one he calls Father, and this is known only in and through the Holy Spirit. The one by whom we call Christ Lord. After all, to say that this is what it is to be God is not a human assertion. Okay? That's my sin and Constantinople. Ephesus and Chalcedon likewise. Okay. And uh, Constantinople beyond that, second Constantinople. With their affirmation that what that we see what it is to be God and what it is to be human in one. In one hypostasis, one concrete being, one prosopon, one face. That we don't look over here to see a God and over here to see a human being, but we see them together absolutely in one, together, without confusion, change, division, or separation. Okay? And then likewise with the Second Council of Nicaea, this is the image of the invisible God, as we spoke about a few minutes ago. That's what all the councils have been defending, and... That's what all the heresies have been trying to avoid. So docetism, well, he wasn't really human. Arianism, well, he wasn't really God. Nestorianism, well, the word and the man are two different beings with two different prosopa. We can't confuse them. All the ancient heresies all try to avoid Christ as the definition of what it is to be God and what it is to be human. Okay? And then one might add perhaps today historicism, meaning that the approach by which if we want to understand who Christ is, we have to get behind the cross to find the real Jesus. We have to get away from the scriptural presentation of the crucified and risen one to get to who we think he really was and so come up with something new every day, just like the Gnostics do. Okay? So this Christ... This crucified and risen one, proclaimed by the apostles in accordance with the scripture, shows us what it is to be God. And, to finish off, I can see everybody's fanning themselves, getting rather hot in here, also shows us what it is to be human. And I don't think we've thought enough about that at all. Okay? Here's a, a, a passage from a letter from St. Ignatius of Antioch to the Christians in Rome. Ignatius of Antioch, about either 95 AD to 105 AD, that very turn of the century, is being taken from Antioch to Rome to be martyred in Rome, and he writes a letter to the Christians in Rome saying, whatever you do, don't try and get me out of my martyrdom. Don't try and bribe the judges, don't try and do this after the other. Okay? And he writes to them, and this, I'm quoting him now, he says, it's better for me to die in Christ Jesus than to be king over the ends of the earth. I seek him who died for our sake. I desire him who rose for us. Birth pangs are upon me. Suffer me, my brethren. Hinder me not from living. Do not wish me to die. Suffer me to receive the pure light. When I shall have arrived there, I shall become a human being. Suffer me to follow the example of the passion of my God. Okay? The, the, the language of birth life and death have been completely reversed. When he says, hinder me not from living, do not wish me to die, that is, do not wish me to die by keeping me alive in this world. Hinder me not from living by keeping me alive in this world. The birth pangs are upon me. He's not yet born. He's about to be born. Okay? And when he's born in this way, when he enters into life this way, he finally becomes a human being. Remember the definition of Chalcedon says that Christ shows us what it is to be God and human in one. We have yet to attain that. I think the background for what Ignatius is saying comes from the Johannine material, Asia Minor, he's from the same part of the world. And Christ's words in the Gospel of John, when at the crucifixion, he doesn't say like he says in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, my God, why have you forsaken me? He says rather, it is finished. It is finished. To tell us thing. It's perfected. It's brought to completion. And what is brought to completion 
I think, is indicated by Pilate just a few verses before, and only in John, when Pilate says, Behold the human being. Idu or anthropos, eke homo, behold the human being. And if that's the case, that takes us all the way back to Genesis. The Gospel of John obviously plays off Genesis. They both begin in the beginning. In the beginning, God created heaven and earth. In the beginning was the word. Think about the, gospel, uh, the, the first chapter of Genesis. In the beginning, God creates, and he does so by speaking. Let there be light. There was light. Let there be a firmament. Let the waters under the heavens be gathered. Let the earth put forth vegetation. Let there be light in the firmament. Let the water bring forth for- swarms of living creatures. Let the earth bring forth living creatures. Let there be, let there be, let there be. Fiat, fiat, fiat. Let there be. It is, it's good. The end of the day, next day. Okay? All of these things are simply spoken into existence by God saying, let it be. Okay? Having declared everything into existence by a word alone, then God announces his own particular project. When it says, then God said, let us make a human being in our image after our likeness. It's a project. It's not let there be a human being, there was, it's good, it's done, over. It's let us make a human being. It's a project. It's the divine intention. It's that which he's deliberating about, how to do it, how to bring it into effect. Okay? It's the only thing which is said to be the divine purpose, and it's the only thing which is not said to be followed by it is finished. So the work of God, the specific work of God, is to create human beings, and that's not done until we see Christ from the cross. Behold the human being, to tell us that it's finished, and we have yet to enter into that reality. As Ignatius, we have yet to become human. The pains of birth are upon me. Suffer me to follow the passion of my Lord. Suffer me to enter into the light. When I will have arrived there, then I will become human. So for every other aspect of creation, all that was needed was the divine fiat, let there be. But for the human being to come into existence, God doesn't give a fiat, we give the fiat, let it be. Okay? So we have yet to become human in the stature of the humanity of Christ, who alone shows us in one what is to be God and what is to be human. That really is the, the shocking truth of orthodoxy. The shocking truth that orthodoxy might have a truth and how it's grounded, as I hope to have shown by looking at the terms like hypothesis, the necessity for scripture interpretation, all the kind of things I looked at at the beginning. And then the content of it, which is what it is to be God and what it is to be human, how that is seen, and what that then demands of us. Okay. Thank you.